our co-host, um, Dr. Ira Anderson, who is, um, oh gosh, I didn't write down your technical title, but he's a senior scientist or like a technical leader at Ames National Lab. And Ira graduated with his BS in 1975 in metallurgical engineering from Michigan Tech. And along his career path, he solved, he helped, he led a team that solved the problem of lead being in, in, in solder. And so go ahead and tell us if you can in the four minute time frame. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, actually, uh, so um, one of the stories um, that really captures our discovery was basically um, um, always remember very well what you did in your PhD. Uh, because uh, after coming uh, to Ames Lab in 87, uh, I was around about maybe 91 or 92 that um, a guy came to visit on campus here at, at Iowa State. And he was um, uh, talking to his former PhD advisor, Rohit Trivedi. And uh, he said, you know, do you want to get involved in a, a solder alloy design uh, project and Rohit said you really got to talk to Ivor because um, <laughs> Rohit knew very well what I had done on my on my thesis. I did my whole thesis on on tin alloys and all the binary systems with tin that included lead tin and and all of the other ones that are lead free. Uh, so um, this guy Fred Yost came and talked to me about that and. And we got a project rolling because um, he had connections in his, his own laboratory at Los Alamos. And um, I'm sorry, at Sandia. And so uh, we uh, explored a couple of different systems. Uh, we settled on the combination of tin silver and tin copper uh, because um, uh, this was, these are strange uh, binaries. And I could say that uh, tin copper is one of the least understood tin systems. And tin silver uh, is also uh, very strange. But then you put the two together, copper and silver. And Bill Bettinger said, um, he was from uh, uh, NIST, from NBS actually at that time. And he said, I really don't understand tin silver. It never should be that way because it has a deep eutectic. And so uh, a deep uh, a depression of the melting temperature, you could say. And so uh, I said to, to um, uh, Fred, I said, we really got to try this, this as a ternary system. Mm -hmm. And take a look at what would happen to a triple um, element uh, melting point. So we looked in the neighborhood of the eutectics for each individual tin copper, tin silver, and lo and behold, boom, it dropped the melting temperature, four degrees. Uh, and that was, that was the eureka moment. Uh, and the other thing I should say is that my, my thesis advisor, uh, John Perpesco said, don't, don't even bother with that. It's been done before. It doesn't work. I said, John, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> So, so, I mean, I'm guessing you're made up a thousand different alloys. I mean, like how many alloys did you have to t test and make up? To oh, we made, yeah, we made tons of them. Um, probably, I don't know, 30, 40 alloys okay. uh, in, that, in that neighborhood. And uh, so it was a master's student who was working for me, Chad Miller, who, who really uh, came running in with a, a chart uh, from the uh, differential scanning calorimeter and said, <laughs> here it is. Uh, you know, you were right. <laughs> so. Oh, that's a happy, that's a happy, that's a happy, like, you know, student, well, right? <laughs> definitely, yes, yeah. Yeah, he got his master's pretty readily that way, that's right. <laughs> so how many people were kind of on your team working on this? About? Um, that, my team included, there were five of us. So Chad Miller, my student, mm -hmm. Um, my technician here at the lab, uh, Bob Terpstra, um, Fred Yost, I already mentioned at uh, Sandia, uh, Albuquerque, and also Jack Smith, who retired and was um, sort of an uh, emeritus uh, laboratory um, uh, uh, person here at Ames Lab. 
Um, and he had actually, uh, he's, a, he's very famous actually for multi-component phase diagrams. Mm -hmm. And so he was editor in chief of Phase Equilibria uh, magazine. So the journal. So um, he, he came on just to keep us all honest about you know, calculating phases. Uh, yeah. So um, that was really that was really fun uh, to have all those different you know different levels of advice and different inputs uh, coming in yeah. uh, to our project that way. Well, and so you know I'm gonna um, kind of we're on the hour and I'm gonna kind of sum up what you what you my, what my co-host Dr. Ivor Anderson of Ames Lab has been describing, which was um, the discovery of lead-free solders, which are made out of the copper, tin, silver system. And I'm so pleased, of course, that it contained copper because you were born in the copper country and- That's graduated. the other reason we added copper, that's right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> awesome that copper is part of the solution. But Ivor um, is gonna be with us um, uh, as we introduce our, um, you know, our speaker this evening. But Ivor graduated with his BS in metallurgical engineering in 1975, and then he's had a distinguished career as a scientist and inventor um, at Ames Lab. So to shift the attention now to Eric, um, Eric Herbert. So um, I'm going to introduce you a second, but I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to put the cover slide up so that I can properly acknowledge um, our sponsors and things. So let me, this is where I wish I could be more adept. All right, here we go. So welcome everyone this evening. If this is your first time joining us, um, you are joining us for Husky Bites. Uh, and um, we have special guest, Dr. Eric Herbert, and we have co-host Dr. Ivor Anderson joining us. It's sort of a material science night, but I think it's gonna amuse people of every, you know, every flavor of, of engineering science and anything else. This is a free webinar every Monday at 6 p.m. Um, you're welcome to join us. Um, we have a hard stop at 7.15. Uh, you don't have to stay with us that long. These are 20 minute webinars uh, followed by Q&A. And our sponsors this evening are um, the company Nanomechanics Incorporated, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about this evening from uh, Dr. Herbert. And then uh, also alum alumni, Walt and Amy uh, Lange, who um, graduated with degrees in different colleges, the College of Sciences and Arts, and also the College of Engineering. And Walt is a metallurgist as well. And Amy, I believe, is a biologist and a teacher. So thank you, everyone, for sponsoring. Um, of course, we're, we're live streaming, so, um, and these are being recorded. So if you need to leave or drop out, um, you can watch them later. So quick poll about who is with us today, just to help us understand our audience. So um, this is, there's going to be a moment, an opportunity for you to fill out a poll in just a second. So are you a Michigan Tech student? Are you a high school student? Are you a homeschool student? Are you an alum? Are you faculty staff? Are you a friend of Michigan Tech? Are you family of current or future students? Are you a curious person? And I, th I think you can answer yes to more than one of these. But um, And uh, we've got about 100 people with us already. Uh, it looks like uh, about 50 to 52 percent of us are graduates of Michigan Tech. Um, another 24, 25 percent are Michigan Tech students. Um, we have curious people, family, we have friends, we have all kinds of people with us tonight. And so um, that will help you understand your audience, uh, Eric. And so I'm going to go to the next slide, um, which I think is my cue to, um, yes, I'm going to stop sharing. And so Eric, can you put your first slide up while I introduce you, please? And so Thank you everyone for joining us. It is another Monday evening and it's a beautiful, beautiful day in Houghton. It is now perfectly blue skies. We had a, a really crazy um, weather cell move through with um, like lightning and thunder and rain and all kinds of things, but now we got crystal blue skies. And um, tonight's speaker is Dr. Eric Herbert, who is a faculty member in the Department of Material Science and Engineering with co-host Dr. Ivor Anderson, who is graduated with his BS in metallurgical engineering in 1975. Ivor is also a member of the College Advisory Board. So Eric um, started his career in an interesting way. He's a deep thinker. He got his BA in political science and business administration, so deep thinker and practical. And then he, um, at some point in his life, fell in love with material science and came back to earn a master's and then a PhD in material science while also doing 
um, uh, lots of research um, with a company uh, that we're going to hear a little bit more of and that has co-sponsored tonight, which is uh, Nano Instruments. He spent an interesting year in Dublin, Ireland in 2009, and then in 2015, he joined us as um, part of our professoriate here at Michigan Tech. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to you, Eric, here to explain more about your topic. And I, are, Ivor, are you seeing Eric's slides? Uh, no, they uh, popped off. So I'm yeah, I saw them for a moment, and then they, they, they also. Uh, I, that's a, a weird technical glitch that I have yet to experience. So uh, do do stop share and then just do reshare again. That usually fixes it. Okay, so I'm gonna. Well, it's even acting weird just on my end. I think I'm gonna shut down PowerPoint and. Uh, All right. Well, and while you're doing that, we're just gonna wait for you then to come back up, and I'm gonna. I'm going to chatter with Ivor. So um, if you missed, we, we started talking about Ivor's um, team's discovery of um, lead-free solders. And so why is that important, Ivor? Why is it important to have a lead-free solder? Um, well, I guess the, uh, the biggest issue that um, uh, everybody experiences actually is what do you do with your old laptop, with your old cell phone, uh, with your old microwave? Um, when it's when it's done working, um, and you know it's all about uh, electronic waste and and what happens to the lead that gets into uh, drinking water eventually uh, mm -hmm. from electronic waste. So um, it came up first in Japan. Um, that became a problem, um, and uh, they're the ones that uh, that pushed a ban on leaded solders uh, at the beginning. Uh, back what year, in, uh, what year did this it did this concern happen about? Was it like in the seventies or? Um, actually, the the one that really led to legislation was basically two thousand and two. Oh wow! It wasn't that long ago. Huh. Yeah. So they they um, instituted themselves a uh, um, a commercial uh, regulation that all the Japanese producers would go lead free, uh, and then it was two thousand six when the uh, European Union officially went lead free. Um, so, you know, it's right. not that long ago. No, yeah. and so Eric is back up. He's got his slides ready. And so, um, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I, the, so what do you see on your end? Because I'm, I'm only seeing, seeing the a few images on the slide here. And uh, I'm seeing the cover slide, um, which has, uh, has your name. There we go. And now I'm seeing learning objectives. When you, you went forward and back just then? Yeah, so is there a title on the cover slide here? Yes, well, on the cover slide, it's, there is not a title actually, no. no. Right, and there's, so can, can you see the red cursor that I'm moving on yes, the screen? Yes, I can yep. do that. Yeah, yeah, there's a missing list of uh, <laughs> collaborators there. There's a missing picture of Oak Ridge below that. All right, this, this problem's gonna probably persist. So if you can, Eric, why don't you print, print a PDF? Just print a PDF, because then we could, you can show your PDF and maybe that'll work. Yeah, yeah. okay, we can. And, and so I'm gonna chat with Ivor a little bit more. Um, so Ivor, um, so, so the solution to the lead-free solder was so so, so right, lead lead with solder is tin with lead, right? Tin with lead. That's what lead-free solder. Yeah, is, right? it, yeah. Primarily uh, for electronics uh, assembly, it's it's the tactic between. Okay, uh, and tin so tin and lead melt at certain points, probably this yeah. way. Yeah, tin and then is, together they melt at a much lower point than right, either of them. Exactly. The, yeah. Okay. And so that's why people used this mixture. And so what, what your group ended up um, doing um, was looking at copper tin, which is another tin, and then tin silver. And right. so then the, you made it, so you looked at the ternary system. So think of a triangle and now temperature as your axis. That's right, that's okay. right. Exactly. And so what's the alloy, like roughly, like? I don't know, pick an atomic percent or weight percent, but what's, what's... Well, it's about, it's about uh, three and a half weight percent silver and about 0.9 weight percent copper. So not much. Not much. Yeah, it's all pushed over to the tin corner. Uh, wow. 
So it's really, it's pretty subtle. Yeah. Well, and with tin lead, it's not over at the tin corner. You know, it's, no. I remember it as being somewhere in the middle-ish. Yeah, it's right about 60-40, basically. 60% okay. tin, 40% lead. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, all right, so I'm going to take some Q&A. So from one of our participants, um, we have, as, just as an FYI, Ivor and I are related. So this is from Walt um, Land, who is one of tonight's sponsors. So you're related in the following way. His, your advisor, um, Ivor, John Perepesco, was a frequent guest at Michigan Tech, sponsored by his advisor, Hub Asenson. Aronson. Ah, Erickson. Okay, all right. It didn't, yeah, so well, there you go. Ivor? Well, and if you want each other's email, just send me an email and I'll, I, will, I will help you guys get connected. Yeah, this is part of the family tree that we always talk about in, in academics yep. and in science circles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and so Leonard asks, what are the racing bibs hanging behind you, Ivor? And I think you explained that already, but go ahead. And oh, explain uh, that again. yeah, those are for uh, half marathons and 10Ks uh, that, that I like to run. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I, do, I, can't, I can't hang them up at home because I have too many of them. So I hang them up in my office where I can do what I like. <laughs> we get the overflow here. And so Eric has, he fell out, he came back on, he's muted and he has started screen sharing. And okay. we are beginning to view Eric, Eric's screen. Um, so when's the last, um, race that you ran, Ivor? Um, the last one I ran was, uh, let's see, last fall, uh, which was, it was uh, called Living History Farms Race, and it's in Des Moines. Uh, at, um, there's a, a great place that has uh, historical farms, farmsteads oh, from wow. all over Iowa and from the beginning uh, when the American Indians set up their uh, their sort of agricultural enterprises uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. in the and it goes all the way through uh, different, every 30, 40 years or so, different types of farms uh, that were established. So we get to run through all the fields up and over the hay. Well, it sounds like... <laughs> It's just a lot of fun. It sounds like the kind of thing that I would do if there was like wine and cheese along the way. Or something like that. You know, and I didn't have to run. If I could just walk, I would do it. I would do it. <laughs> well, oh. it, it, yeah, at the end of the course, we finish up the, up the main street of this um, recreated historical town. Uh, and uh, then at the end, they serve you donuts and beef stew. So, oh, wow. That's a healthy mix. <laughs> Oh, so Michael wants to know, did you win, Michael wants to know, did you win the race? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's always important to have people behind you because you can see all the people in front of you. That, that's my theory anyway. <laughs> that's funny. Oh gosh, Eric, is there anything I can do to help you? One of the things we well, could do. Yeah, with me, so it just, uh, what a calamity here. It just, uh, actually just crashed my computer. So we're back up and, and okay. running. So I've got, uh, just created the, the PDF file. Let me find that and uh, okay. fly with the PDF version. You know, we're, we're academics, we're nimble. But um, if, if, it, if it were to help, you could send the, the PowerPoint to Sue and you could just say next slide and she could share her screen. But um, no, it's been interesting. So, Ivor, how did you wind up at Ames? What, you know, like, what, what were the steps? Wait, wait, I think, I think Eric's live now. We've got a title. This looks official. We, we can see it all. All right. Yep, and I think, is, I think this is big enough. This actually works really well. So, moderately official. Okay. All right. I am reintroducing Dr. Eric Herbert, who is <laughs> assistant professor at Michigan Tech um, Material Science and Engineering Department. And um, he's been with us since 2015. And He's going to speak with us about um, some of the really in interesting, you know, technical issues associated with storing energy at the nanoscale. Eric. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully, I know a little bit more about that stuff than uh, evidently trying to get uh, a PowerPoint presentation to run on Zoom. So, no I think after uh, all the work we've been through uh, the past semester with all this, that uh, 
we wouldn't have this problem anymore. No, no, there's always some glitch, trust me. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thanks for the, the introduction, Janet. I uh, also want to thank all of you folks for taking time out of your day to learn a little something about how we use material science and engineering to figure out the best way to try to make uh, energy storage devices or really just next generation batteries. Right? So first thing I want to do is uh, point out that uh, a lot of the content I'm going to share with you this evening is the culmination of work from a number of folks. Steve Hackney and Nancy Dudney are my primary uh, collaborators or partners in crime. Uh, Violet and Maria are students here at Michigan Tech. And Fani is a colleague of mine in, uh, in India. So without their direct input and support, we just wouldn't be having this conversation uh, this evening. So to all of them, I just want to give out a resounding thank you as, as well. And actually, well, I guess while I've got the pulpit, uh, I'm going to specifically call out Steve Hackney here. Um, a lot of his uh, unique insights have been a, the, the key piece of the puzzle to driving a lot of this and trying to figure out how all these pieces fit together. And so for me personally, it's just been... Uh, uh, a real blessing to have an opportunity to, to work with Steve. He's been in the department here for a number of years. And so he's uh, just started his uh, sort of phased retirement uh, here at Michigan Tech in material science. And so we will all miss him significantly. And uh, I keep poking him and telling him, well, you know, retirement or not, John, you're still going to keep on working. So, uh, so anyway, uh, give a big shout out to Steve. All right. So uh, the webinar this evening, I don't know if this works to slide. Nope, so we'll Perfect. just on it here, there we go. Mm -hmm. So the, the webinar this evening is basically built around two learning objectives, all right? So the first one is to compare and contrast two types of stress relaxation mechanisms that occur in crystalline metals. And then the second one is uh, uh, to describe two key attributes of solid electrolytes that by design are engineered to prevent catastrophic device failure, all right? And so just to make sure we're all on the same page here, this electrolyte is just one of the key components of our battery. All right, so that's the material that gets sandwiched between the, the two electrodes. And so we need to keep those uh, electrodes electrically insulated from one another. And it's the electrolyte that, that does that, all right? So, uh, so those are our learning objectives. And in order to accomplish those objectives, our lesson outline uh, is telling us here that basically the discussion is gonna be broken up into three sections, all right? So uh, the first one, uh, basically just going to show you the problem that we're trying to solve here um, and then present what many folks in the battery world perceive to be the, the holy grail solution, right? And that's this device called a solid state battery, okay? And so from there, the, the second section, I'm going to give you some key material science background and and the reason we're doing that is that you really need that background in order to really understand and fully appreciate the, the problem that we're trying to solve here, all right? So in this second section, we're going to take just a little peek at the, the structure of crystalline metals and some of the basic nuts and bolts associated with uh, uh, two stress relaxation mechanisms. So there's going to be dislocation glide and solid state diffusion, okay? So from there, we'll take a look at uh, the fundamental <clears throat> roadblock, excuse me, in developing these SSBs. And then we're going to see what Goldilocks has to tell us about uh, overcoming that roadblock by designing or really engineering our battery materials to avoid what we call the defect danger zone. And we need to avoid that in order to keep our solid electrolyte separator from fracturing, right? And so if that uh, electrolyte layer fractures, that's a really bad thing. That's basically just synonymous with device failure, okay? All right, so this uh, Photoshopped image here on the, the right hand, or sorry, left hand side of the slide, so uh, that image basically illustrates the basic problem that we're trying to solve here, right? So the issue uh, mm -hmm. became really famous back in 2017 when Samsung released its Galaxy Note 7. And so in trying to solve this problem, the, the primary issue is really just trying to figure out how to get away from the, the flammable liquid electrolytes that are used in traditional lithium ion batteries, okay? <clears throat> so. One potential solution to that problem is a device called a solid state battery, all right? And so schematically that looks like something or something like this on the slide here, all right? And so as the, the, the name implies, the idea is to replace the flammable liquid electrolyte with a non-flammable solid state version here, okay? And so <clears throat> the idea is that in addition to improving the safety by using that solid electrolyte. It also allows batteries to be made using a pure metallic lithium anode. And so by making that switch to pure lithium, we can make the safest, lightest, smallest batteries possible. 
right? And that's why this particular architecture is frequently referred to as the, the Holy Grail solution. <laughs> So the, uh, the most significant roadblock in, in developing this technology basically boils down to the simple fact that we don't really fully understand the material instabilities that develop at this critical interface here between the lithium anode and the solid electrolyte separator, okay? And so in order to really understand the origin of those instabilities, that's where we really need to have a little bit more material science background, okay? So the, the first thing we need to kind of take a look at here and get a handle on um, is recognizing that uh, for most of our elemental metals, when those solidify out of the melt, right, right, the ions are gonna crystallize into a periodic three-dimensional array, right? And it's similar to what you see here in the slide. And for a number of elemental metals like lithium, sodium, potassium, right? So they're gonna crystallize into uh, this really unique structure here where the basic building block is this cubic unit that has one atom in the middle of the, the cell, okay, or the middle of this cubic crystal structure. And so this image illustrates what we call, as the image sort of clearly points out, this is the, the body-centered cubic crystal structure, okay? And so next, what we want to consider is uh, what happens to a metal when its boundaries are mechanically loaded in some fashion, okay? And so basically what it boils down to is that uh, materials really don't like stress or pressure any more than you or I do, right? So they're just trying to figure out how to use the, the mechanisms that are at their disposal in order to alleviate any stress or, that, or stress or pressure that builds up, okay? And so this schematic illustration down here at the bottom of the slide does a pretty good job of illustrating the basic idea behind trying to alleviate pressure, all right? So the idea here over in the, the bottom left is that uh, we've got all the atoms uh, sort of organized in their equilibrium positions here, right? And so now as we apply this external force, right? So just imagine we're pulling the metal through the, the top and bottom of your computer screen. And so as a result, the bonds between the atoms are physically gonna be stretched here, right? So there's some separation distance here under load that wasn't here over in the, the equilibrium state, right? With no load, okay? So we've got this, uh, this stretching between the, the bonds here, right? But now once the, the stress resolved on these 45 degree planes, right? Once that stress reaches a critical threshold, then these adjacent planes of atoms are gonna start sliding past one another, right? Mm -hmm. And they're gonna do that in a way that's sort of analogous to how you would change the shape of a deck of cards, right? So that's what this picture over here is showing us, okay? And so once that load is removed, all the energy that we put into the system in terms of stretching those bonds, we get that energy back, right? So we recover that stretch that's illustrated here, right? But this, uh, this shearing of the adjacent planes of atoms, that's permanent. We're not gonna recover that, right? So in the unloaded condition, we recover the stretch, but the planes are still gonna be sheared, okay? All right, so the important takeaway here is that uh, our material basically exhibits this self-limiting behavior, right? So once this critical threshold is exceeded over here, then the material limits the amount of stress or pressure that it can experience by just letting those adjacent planes of atoms slide past one another, right? So in terms of stress relaxation, this basic picture at the bottom of the slide here does a pretty good job of uh, uh, you know, giving us the, the, the basic idea of what's going on. However, mm -hmm. All right, the, the picture is not quite right. All right, it's a good place to start, but it's not quite right. And so what's missing here is what we really need is a, a very simple correction, but it's a really important correction because this idea of uh, the uh, adjacent planes of atoms just sliding past each other like a rigid deck of cards here, this isn't what we observe experimentally, all right? <clears throat> What we see the, the vast majority of the time is this stepwise process that requires a, a linear defect in the lattice, and we call that linear de defect a dislocation, okay? And so ah, it's, you it's, said it's, the D you know, word. said the D word, yep. <laughs> Can't get away with it uh, out of this presentation. So we got to have the D word. So this dislocation in its simplest form uh, basically is analogous to an extra half plane of atoms here that just gets stuffed into the crystal, okay? And so uh, it's through that defect that we can now talk about how these adjacent planes of atoms are really going to slide past one another, okay? And so this schematic illustration over here does a good job of, of trying to graphically illustrate that. And so in the slideshow, there was a simple animation that shows what happens when, uh, you know, these elements 
patents are uh, exposed or uh, are put under this shear stress that's trying to move the top half of the block over here to the right and the bottom half of the block to the left. And so the gist of of it is that when you look at this rigid slip analogy, right, if we focus on this plane of atoms or these two adjacent planes of atoms, for rigid slip, all of these bonds here that I'm indicating with the cursor, they all have to break simultaneously, all right? And that just requires an enormous amount of stress and pressure to make that happen. And as I mentioned, that's just not what we observe experimentally, all right? So if we change the picture up a little bit and we stuff this extra half plane of atoms into the lattice, now we can see how that changes this picture up because what happens is uh, as we apply this shear stress, right? This, uh, it's tough to visualize here without the animation, but. I'm, I'm animating it, shear stress, ready? There you go, there you go, perfect, excellent. So she's pushing hard enough that this bond is now gonna break and it's gonna reform over here, right? And so then this vertical line becomes our dislocation. So this atom is no longer bonded to this one, right? It's, this terminates here, and so that's what looks like this extra half plane of atoms that gets stuffed into the lattice. And so that process just repeats itself, right? So then- right. By the way, goes, by the way, it, I just want to say he's yep. up to chapter eight in Callister right now. He went from chapter one to eight <laughs> in, in the last seven minutes. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> drinking from the fire hose, here we go, right? No, so good job. The stepwise process that we really need in order to, to talk about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this mechanism by which adjacent planes of atoms are going to be allowed to slide past one another in a manner that's consistent with what we observe experimentally, okay? So, uh, so that's it. This, uh, this first mechanism for stress relaxation is now this shear driven dislocation glide, all right? And so, as I said, that's the mechanism that we observe experimentally, and it takes much less stress to create the same effect. You know, we can just take this uh, sort of lip that exists at the interface and push it out the other side um, just by having this inchworm process or this stepwise process of uh, this dislocation being pushed through the crystal, okay? So there's mechanism number one. The second one that we want to look at, um, and if I have not lost my place, there we are. So the second one we want to look at is uh, something called stress-directed diffusion, okay? And so uh, bottom line is that, uh, um, at least with respect to our battery problem, all right, we're interested in this uh, stress-directed diffusion process. And diffusion, all it means is that we've got some sort of material trans transport that occurs by this stepwise atomic motion, okay? And so we've got these two basic illustrations here that do a good job of describing the, the basic concept for us, all right? So if we start over here with the image on the left, we've got a crystalline solid that's just missing a few atoms, all right? And that's totally normal. Our crystals are always missing lattices. It's just a matter of how many uh, missing sites there are, all right? And so we uh, cleverly refer to these point defects or these missing atoms as vacancies, right? Uh, ingenious name for it. And so the basic idea is that we've got this uh, locally applied stress. So here I'm just gonna draw it coming in at the, the corner of this block, all right? And so the, the idea, all right, the basic picture is that we've got this locally applied force. That's gonna create a stress concentration here, all right? And that produces is a gradient in the pressure that radiates into the material here, right? Mm -hmm. And so the material wants to alleviate that pressure. It doesn't like that gradient, right? So what happens is um, this diffusion process is going to allow these vacancies to preferentially migrate into this stressed volume, right? And then some of these atoms that are located in the stressed volume, they're going to migrate out away from the stressed volume. And so that's how this pressure is going to be alleviated. It takes some time for that to occur. It's not an instantaneous thing by any stretch, right? But uh, that's the basic mechanism behind this stress-directed diffusion. So the stress creates this gradient in the, uh, of the chemical potential that drives the migration of the, the vacancies into this uh, stressed volume, and that's what alleviates the pressure, okay? So clearly in order for this uh, stress-directed diffusion mechanism to work, we're gonna have these vacancies, right? And so that's gonna be really similar to this simple uh, you know, numbers game that you play here. So if you take the vacancy away, right, and clearly this mechanism becomes completely inoperable, right? The game just doesn't work anymore. So we've got to have those vacancies. And it turns out that the vacancies 
or at least the concentration of the vacancies uh, is exponentially dependent on temperature. So the higher temperatures you go to, the more vacancies you have at your disposal to enable this uh, stress-directed diffusion mechanism to efficiently alleviate. They're vibrating. They're vibrating yeah. more and more and more. You got it. That's right. Exactly. It just makes it a whole lot easier for these guys to move around. Okay. All right. So, uh, so now we got a kind of a bird's eye view on uh, these two stress relaxation mechanisms. So what I want to do here now is just uh, quickly compare these two mechanisms and uh, do that specifically in relation to lithium. All right. So we've got our two stress relaxation mechanisms. We've got shear-driven dislocation glide and stress-directed diffusion. All right, so the way to think about this shear-driven dislocation glide, that's the master switch on the pressure release valve, right? That's the one we'd like to be able to use all the time. The issue is that it depends on the availability of dislocations, right? Not only do they have to be within that stress volume, but they gotta be mobile, or we gotta have a dislocation source around something that can create dislocations for us within that stressed volume, all right? Now, our other mechanism, the stress-directed diffusion, comparatively speaking, this one's gonna be a whole lot less efficient. And that's because it depends on a couple of factors. Number one is gonna be the diffusion length. So if we're asking those vacancies to diffuse in from a long distance, then this mechanism becomes very inefficient, all right? And the other piece of the puzzle is that we need those vacancies. And clearly the only way we get them is to be at high temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. So. We've that tells us we've got to be at high temperatures in order for this stress-directed diffusion to really be an efficient mechanism for stress relaxation, okay? So now let's look at that in relation to lithium metal, and we're going to do that specifically at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're at room temperature. So at that temperature, bulk lithium is basically soft as butter, right? So the master switch for the pressure release valve, that's this dislocation glide, so that's going to trigger when the pressure gets to a very modest value of about half a megapascal, so if I compare that number to some structural materials that we're a little bit more familiar with, so an aluminum alloy or steels, so their trigger for the pressure release valve is very high, comparatively speaking, right? Orders of magnitude higher, okay? So bottom line is lithium is very soft at room temperature, okay? Now, at room, or sorry, lithium melts at a temperature of 357 degrees Fahrenheit, so just a little bit warmer than what we would bake a cake at. Okay, <laughs> so <clears throat> at room temperature, we're at a really significant fraction of its absolute melting temperature, all right? So we call that a homologous temperature, that's this TH. And so at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, we're at a homologous temperature of 0.65, okay? So we're at 65% of its absolute melting temperature. Well, that temperature is really high, all right? And there's a really important outcome from that. And that is that at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is constantly going through this process of annealing, right? And so basically what it boils down to is that um, uh, it's, it's kind of a complicated process, but basically it's uh, recovery, recrystallization, green, grain growth, all these processes that are happening simultaneously. And the upshot <clears throat> is that uh, the dislocation density in our lithium is continually decreasing with time. All right, so even at a modest temperature, room temperature, this dislocation density is going down and down because we have this annealing process that's taking place. And so that's gonna make it a little bit more difficult for this dislocation glide mechanism to really operate efficiently, all right? So now let's compare that to uh, what's going on with our stress-directed diffusion. So at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, even though we're at a high homologous temperature, that temperature really isn't that high. So it's not like we just have a ton of vacancies around to enable this uh, stress-directed diffusion mechanism, all right? So the bottom line is that mechanism isn't going to be particularly efficient. It's available, it's working, but it doesn't work all that well, okay? So these factors are going to contribute really significantly into how we think about the pressure that builds up at this critical interface in our solid-state battery, okay? So that being said, Let's uh, basically just uh, circle back a bit here, all right? So this is now a picture of the problem we're trying to solve, right? This is the, the potential solution that we're ultimately interested in. And as I said before, it's uh, you know, the fact that we don't really understand the, the material instabilities that develop at this critical interface during charging of the cell, okay? 
And so in this particular image, they're showing us, um, um, or schematic anyway, they're telling us that the solid state electrolyte is comprised of a polycrystalline material, right? And so basically all that means is that uh, um, our, uh, our solid electrolyte is comprised of a whole bunch of crystals or grains, right? And so if we were to look at just one of those crystals, what you'd see is that it's got a structure that's gonna be very similar to uh, what we talked about before with the lithium, right? And then if we were to look at any of the adjacent grains, we'd see that that grain has the exact same crystal structure, but the unit cell's just got a different orientation in space, <clears throat> right? It's just been rotated a bit, okay? So bottom line is if we were now to, to take this polycrystalline material, we polish that surface so that it's really flat, it's got a mirror-like surface finish, we put the right chemicals on that surface, and then if we go look at it in an optical microscope, we'd see something that resembles this schematic illustration here. And so all of these gray lines now would represent uh, uh, the physical boundaries, at least in two dimensions, all right, between all of these individual grains within our polycrystalline metal, okay? So that basic knowledge now helps us understand what's going on in this picture over here on the right-hand side, okay? So here we're looking at an image created by a scanning electron microscope. And so here we're looking at the cross-section of a polycrystalline ceramic solid electrolyte, and it's been electrochemically cycled to failure, all right? And so the, the failure mechanism is this metallic lithium here that is preferentially infiltrated along the grain boundaries of our ceramic electrolyte. And so basically the lithium has penetrated. It started off at this interface, and then it just followed these grain boundaries, worked its way all the way through until it got to the cathode. Once it made the, the trip to the cathode, then the device short circuits and it fails, okay? Yeah. So this is our fundamental problem. It catches on fire. Right, then we end up with this picture up here in the, the top left. So that's what we're trying to solve, right? So bottom line is we gotta figure out how to beat that. And so the immediate answer would be, well, just go to a single crystal version. And so we've done that and, or say we, we as a community have done that. And so we surprisingly discover that, well, it doesn't matter. The lithium just finds another defect at the interface to exploit, and it does the exact same thing, all right? So it's images like this one and uh, some other data that I'm gonna show you that basically paints the picture of this sort of two apparent paradoxes. That's the way we think of, of metallic lithium. And so the first paradox is graphically illustrated by this image. And so the, the big question is, you know, how on earth does lithium infiltrate the grain boundaries of a ceramic electrolyte? All right, relatively speaking, the ceramic is extremely strong and the lithium, as I mentioned before, it's soft as butter. So intuitively, it just doesn't make any sense that it's capable of supporting the stresses that are required to effectively break apart this ceramic, okay? Is, is, is this a zirconate, LLZO? Yeah, so this is a lithium lanthanum zirconium oxide, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the basic building block for a lot of the, the ceramic electrolytes. We dope it with uh, either aluminum or tantalum to help improve some of the, the ion transport properties, but that's the basic building block. So, and, um, and Eric, um, it yep. is true too that this um, oxide was uh, uh, put as a candidate uh, solid state electrode uh, electrolyte between the anode and cathode to prevent uh, in the old days, with the uh, liquid electrolytes, uh, daggers of uh, lithium dendrites growing through, wasn't it? Yes, that's exactly right. And so mm -hmm. this is just the, the next evolutionary step in that exact same problem. So, you know, in fact, some people still refer to these as uh, uh, metallic dendrites. And, you know, yeah. it's kind of a, you know, strictly speaking, not quite right, but at least conceptually, it's the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> Right, so uh, so no, you're you're absolutely correct. So uh, so lo and behold, we're still trying to solve the same problem. And in fact, the original thinking was, well, gosh, you know, we can beat those uh, the dendrites that you're talking about. We can mechanically suppress them by just putting the the proverbial brick wall in their way, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to go to a ceramic electrolyte, and that's the proverbial brick wall. And the lithium is soft as butter, so that'll just stop any of these dendrites dead in their tracks, right? They can't go. They can't go through the electrolyte. They might go sideways. But they did, not right? Not going to go through. But lo and behold, there they are going right through it. <laughs> right? So this was a very surprising result to, to see. Um, a lot of folks were scratching their head going, 
how is this physically possible, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so there's paradox number one, all right? So paradox number two, at least from our perspective, comes in the form of these hardness data, right? And these are equally perplexing. So I'm not gonna get into all the, the details here, but suffice it to say, the data just don't look anything like what we would nominally expect, all right? So all I wanna do here is to make one simple point, and that is that out here at the deepest depths, so we're at a uh, thousand nanometers or one micron, or one, one millionth of a meter, all right? So relatively small length scales here, okay? And so the, the, uh, the hardness that we would expect to measure out there would be about three, three and a half maybe times the, the yield strength of bulk polycrystalline lithium, all right? So that'd put us at about one and a half megapascals. And so clearly we are well beyond that level of stress here, all right? And so, as I said, these data now represent the second paradox for us, which basically is, you know, now wait a minute, Again, how on earth does lithium support the sort of pressures that we're observing here experimentally? Because physically, this doesn't make any sense at all, right? This just shouldn't happen, okay? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and I guess let me just make sure we're all on the same page here with respect to why we care. And it's exactly the point that Ivor brought up just a minute ago. So we're trying to figure out how to beat you know, the formation of any lithium filaments originating at this interface, the critical interface over here. We don't want those... Um, uh, filaments or dendrites to form and then propagate through the solid electrolyte. And so what we're observing experimentally is that lithium is, at least at these small length scales, is capable of supporting pressures that are orders of magnitude higher than we nominally expect or, or would anticipate, okay? So uh, to make a really long story short, basically uh, um, we propose that a uh, potential explanation for both of these apparent paradoxes Lies in a phenomenon where two, lies in a phenomenon that is rooted in material science in a way that is conveniently captured by this very simple expression here: smaller is stronger. Right now, this is not something that we came up with on our own. In fact, we're just following the footsteps of some folks from the, the late '50s that uh, made these first sort of experimental observations. But what we are doing is carrying the torch forward in a way that uh, uh, takes the basic concepts that they created. Um, and then uh, uh, allows us to apply how that works in this case to building up pressure within these small defects at this uh, buried interface, all right? Okay, so without the animations, uh, we'll see how this works here. But to, um, so anyway, the basic idea is that this slide does a, a really good job of graphically trying to illustrate, illustrate this concept behind smaller is stronger, right? And it does so with, uh, um, I guess, just using this concept of a length scale dependent strength. Um, and that gives us some physical insight into how the stresses or how these stress relaxation mechanisms control the pressure that develops within these lithium filled interface defects, okay? And specifically, it's, it's the mm -hmm. development of that stress that occurs during charging, okay? So if we begin with uh, this schematic on the right, then uh, the basic idea is that uh, You've got uh, lithium ions that are traveling through the solid electrolyte, right? We're charging the cell here. And so they're preferentially going to diffuse or plate out at these um, um, interface defects, okay? And so um, by preferentially diffusing there, that's what gives rise to this local stress concentration at this buried interface, okay? And so now if we move over to this schematic illustration over here on the left, so this plot basically illustrates the, the pressure within one of these lithium filled defects as a function of the, the length scale over here on the x-axis, okay? Now keep in mind we're doing this or talking about this in the context of a pure metal at a high homologous temperature, all right? right? So this yellowish box down here in the bottom right hand corner, that represents the length scale threshold. So that's this dashed vertical line here, right? So as long as we're above that length scale threshold, then this box represents the uh, really what is the, uh, the self limiting factor, right? This is the master switch on the pressure release valve that prevents the pressure from getting any higher than the yield strength, which we said for lithium was about half a megapascal, all right? So the bulk properties control the pressure out here. Once we get below that length scale, which puts us down here, all right, now what's happening is something very unique, and that is that initially the pressure is gonna climb, all right, and it climbs up this uh, sort of triangular pyramid here, or this triangle, I guess, and it's climbing because within that stressed volume of lithium, it becomes statistically much harder to find the mobile distance 
locations, the active dislocation, multiplication sources, or the brain boundaries, basically all the types of defects that we really need to enable any sort of efficient stress relief by shear driven dislocation glide, all right? And so if we those mechanisms readily, then the pressure just grows, all right? Now, eventually, as we continue to go down in length scale, we hypothesize that eventually there's a reversal that takes place, right? That's this peak here. So now the pressure is going to start to drop, okay? And we propose that <clears throat> that pressure drop is due to a transition in that stress relaxation mechanism. And so the tr transition is going to be from the shear driven dislocation glide on this side, right, to the stress directed diffusion over here on this side, right. And so what's happening is we go down in length scale, the diffusion length is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so that mechanism becomes more and more efficient. And so the pressure just goes down with decreasing length scale, okay. So the, the net effect, <clears throat> basically, and I think we need the next slide, or do we here? Uh, that's not going to show up. All right, well, so the next, or I guess the, the net effect here is that uh, we get this critical defect dimension that's really just right for maximizing this stress concentration here, right? And that's what's going to promote failure of the solid electrolyte by fracture. And so that is now going to be what we refer to as it's labeled here as this defect danger zone. Okay. So the idea is that, uh, um, you know, big lithium filled interface defects like this one, they just don't pose much of a threat, right? Because there's a high probability of finding the, the defects you need to enable the, uh, the master switch on the pressure release valve to work, right? So dislocation glide works over here. Um, when you go to the other end of the extreme and very small defects like this, these two don't pose much of a threat. And that's because we're over here where the diffusion length is short enough that stress directed diffusion can alleviate the pressure within that defect, right? But then this is the bad one. This is the one that Goldilocks says, oh, you better watch out because here, the diffusion length is too long for any efficient stress relief by diffusion, and the defect is too small to find any or to, to have a high probability of finding those defects. And so that's where the pressure at this apex is going to be the highest, and that's what promotes fracture of the solid electrolyte, right? So this is the length scale we need to try to avoid, okay? So in very broad brushstrokes, it's these types of length scale effects that are thought to be the source of the, the stress concentrations that develop at that critical interface and enable the formation and growth of those lithium filaments that are going to cause the cell to fail by this uh, short circuit event. All right. So, so when the stress concentrates, it creates a crack. And once yep. there's a crack, the lithium can go in that direction and make a short circuit. Yep. You got it. That's it. Exactly. I understood it. Yep. <laughs> I have a PhD in this field. I should understand it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Excellent. I'm, uh, <laughs> otherwise, I really, really screwed something up. So, uh, all right. No, no, so, no. You're uh, doing good. Your teaching is very, very excellent. No, it, it is. It is. This is a very, actually, this is a very deep field. I mean, you know, this is um, what the latest researchers are studying like crazy because yeah. these problems can be solved, right? We've, we've now it's the holy grail. So. Yep, you got it, exactly, right? All right, so we got, uh, I think, just about uh, four more slides, or actually just three more slides with any, uh, All right. any and, and here. So we're I just want to ahead. encourage the audience to type in your Q&A now, because this is an excellent time to have questions and answers, um, because, and there's a little field down at the bottom, and um, happy, we will, we will stay on to about 7.15 answering questions, and go ahead and, go ahead, Eric. Okay. All right, so, uh, so experimentally, we want to get in there and try to, you know, get our fingers and hands on, uh, you know, what are these stress relaxation mechanisms in lithium, and is there some way to corroborate uh, any of this hypothesis that we've been developing, right? So to do that, um, this is basically just a slide that shows some of the, the experimental setup that we use, okay? So uh, the basic idea, we're going to use this technique called nanoindentation. All right, and so from a 30,000 foot level, the idea is we're going to drive a probe of some known geometry into the surface of the lithium, and then we're simultaneously just going to record the applied load and the corresponding displacement, okay? And so those data uh, basically amount to a mechanical fingerprint, right? And we can use that fingerprint to extract information about the material's mechanical properties and its stress relaxation mechanisms, okay? So 
Lithium is highly reactive, right? So we got to figure out some way to eliminate or help mitigate any of the potential contamination effects. So all the experiments are done inside the controlled atmosphere of this glove box where we can control the exposure to water and oxygen. We keep it at uh, at or below 0.1 part per million, okay? And so uh, the instrument uh, uh, that we're going to use or the measurements system is called the nano flip and that's pictured here in the center of the slides that comes to us from uh, nanomechanics out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Okay. And so you can see the lithium films here, they get vapor deposited onto these glass slides. Those in turn are mounted to these aluminum plates that get bolted down to the stage on the nano flip. And so then we can look at it through these optical microscope uh, objectives here and map out all the test sites that we want to test. And then this stage basically slides forward and then it flips, hence the name. It flips 90 degrees and then that, that orients the surface of the sample so that it's perpendicular to the indenter probe over here. Okay. All right. And so over here is just um, uh, an optical microscope image that's showing you some of the residual hardness impressions in one of the lithium films. All Those right. are the triangles. Yep. So the triangles are exactly what, uh, it's just a replica of the, the diamond probe, right, that we're driving into the surface of the lithium. Okay. And so to give you some perspective on the length scale here, <clears throat> Those, uh, the indents are a little over a micron deep, so they're about a millionth of a meter deep. And then each of these three faces here on each of the impressions uh, measures about 8.3 millionths of a meter in length, all right? So they're relatively small features, all right? And then all of these lines here, as you might guess, those are now the grains, right? So it's a polycrystalline lithium film, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on from there, um, so, uh, so yeah, this is kind of one of the money shots, right? So here we're looking at representative load displacement curves. So remember, this is the fundamental data that comes out of that experiment, right? We control the load, we measure the corresponding displacement, we're driving that diamond probe into the surface of the sample, right? There's what the, the residual impression looks like when we pull it out, okay? Now, there is uh, a whole lot that's going on here, but for our Right now, uh, I just want to draw your attention to three key features, right? So the first one is this really abrupt transition here that occurs, right? And you see it in both mm -hmm. data sets with two different strain rates. So this really abrupt transition that occurs um, from relatively smooth monotonically load displacement, in <laughs> monotonically increasing load displacement curves to then that's followed by this serrated flow on the other side of the curve, right? So there's item number one. Second is just the, the stochastic nature of the transition point itself, right? So both the stress level and the indentation depth at this transition point varies wildly from one test location to the next. So as you march around from one spot to the next on the surface, you get a very different result, okay, in terms of where this transition occurs in any way, right? And then finally, in comparing the two data sets, it's really the, the slope of the initial portion of the load displacement curve down here and here that gives us uh, some immediate insight into the strain rate dependence, okay? Mm -hmm. So collectively, it's basically three things. It's the abrupt transition, the stochastic nature of that transition, and the rate dependence, right? Those are the three key features that are gonna directly inform how we rationalize the, the hardness or the, the pressure that the lithium can support as a function of indentation depth, okay? So we're going to take a big jump. We're going to go all the way from there to this uh, final plot or final slide here now. All right. So bear with me. We're on the home stretch. So make a really long story short, we basically use the, the measured hardness from the indentation experiments to create this two-dimensional model that now allows us to describe the state of stress that exists. Let me find my cursor to uh, describe the state of stress that exists all along this interface between our lithium filled interface defect and the, the solid electrolyte separator, okay? And so it's through that model that we're able to identify this defect danger zone, right? And that's going to correspond to our testing conditions, of course, right? So we take all of that information and it basically comes out in terms of this plot over here on the right hand side. Again, there's a ton going on in that plot. Don't worry about all the details, right? The basic picture that emerges out of that plot is really simple to understand, right? And so that basic picture that emerges here is that the pressure within any of these lithium filled interface defects, right, is completely dependent on the volume of that interface defect, all right? 
So at small length scales, that's gonna be down here close to the origin, okay? The diffusion length is short enough that that stress-directed diffusion mechanism is an effective stress relief, right? So the pressure is gonna be relatively low. So that's why the stresses are small down here, okay? And so uh, the basic idea <clears throat> is that as we go out the x-axis here, right, the dimensions of the defect are getting bigger. And so that <clears throat> stress-directed diffusion mechanism becomes less efficient. And so the pressure is building as we increase in uh, uh, the, the volume of the defect, all right? And so based on this statistical analysis of all the indentation data, the transition from diffusion to dislocation mediated flow, so it turns out that there's a maximum elastic perturbation that occurs uh, within that stressed volume, right? And that's right up here at the apex of this defect. So we're stuffing a bunch of lithium into this thing, right? It's elastically deforming. We're pushing that we're compressing the lithium down, but it can only go so far. And for these operating conditions, that magical number comes out to be 10.2 nanometers, all right? So once you get to that critical threshold, then one of two things is going to, going to occur. Either now the stressed volume is large enough that it encompasses uh, some sort of a dislocation multiplication mechanism, or the volume is large enough to find a dislocation to help alleviate pressure, right? And so that's going to bring the pressure down, that's this green curve, or the solid electrolyte's going to fracture. One of those two things, okay? So this red box then indicates what we're going to refer to as the defect danger zone. So if you're operating within, or if you have defects that are within that length scale, for these operating conditions, that's a big red flag, okay? Because uh, that's where the pressures are gonna be the highest and that's gonna promote fracture of the solid electrolyte up here, okay? So, uh, so that's it, you know, the, the important takeaway message here is that uh, for those operating conditions, uh, we can predict the most dangerous defect volumes and those are the ones that are gonna promote failure of the solid electrolyte by fracture, okay? So in terms of using any of that information to uh, you know, help engineer batteries that are gonna be optimized to mitigate the stresses that develop at that buried interface, then our analysis basically says two things. Number one, we gotta figure out how to control the dimensions of those surface defects over here so that we avoid this defect danger zone, okay? And then number two, we gotta figure out how to develop the solid electrolytes so that they don't behave as the proverbial brick wall. Ideally, what we want is a solid electrolyte up here that can actually deform and help alleviate the pressure that develops at the apex of that defect, right? So that's what we're looking for out of our next generation solid electrolytes, okay? All right, so uh, we're <clears throat> rolling low on time here. I'm not gonna read through uh, this closing slide, but uh, I know it's gonna be available uh, uh, after the fact, so you can come back and look at it if you're interested, but I think I just sort of summarized the, the whole thing there. So anyway, there's a lot that we know now that we didn't know before about how to manage stress at this critical interface between the solid electrolyte separator and our lithium anode, right? So in uh, broad brushstrokes, uh, that's kind of where, where we are with the, <clears throat> the, the state of the art and trying to figure out how to engineer our next generation solid state batteries. All right. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have. And sorry, right. the PowerPoint stuff didn't work out. <laughs> no, yeah, no, Eric, great, great rally. And um, so I'm going to, um, if you can stop your video, I'm going to share my screen and um, I encourage the audience to load up um, any questions they have. I think it's a great testament to the, um, uh, you know, that it's kind of 6.52 and we've got about 100 people already here. So I, I, I do want to, um, I want to uh, just make sure that we um, discuss um, briefly the next um, speaker. So our next speaker is, um, uh, Dr. Tim Havens, who is the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Computing, who's going to be discussing with us warm and fuzzy machine learning um, uh, with co-host Hani um, Dilam Salihi, who was his first PhD student or one of his first PhD students, um, who is now a machine learning researcher at Adobe uh, and who graduated out of Michigan Tech out of the department of ECE, which is electrical and computer engineering in 2017. Um, so I encourage you to join us, um, uh, join us early for a conversation. And um, uh, we're now gonna go to Q and A. I wanna thank again our sponsors for the evening. 
Um, it was wonderful to hear from you. And I'm going to stop my screen share now so that we can see each other's faces. And Eric, I know you went to, um, you, you moved away from, um, you know, like a video, because I know there were some, some sort of, um, there were some connection issues, but maybe you can try to join us again by video. And so um, I want to thank everyone for being with us um, this evening. We're going to take questions for about the next 15 minutes. I want to thank co-host Dr. Ivor Anderson from Ames Laboratory, as well as um, special speaker Dr. Eric Herbert. Um, so if you have questions about lead-free solder, or if you have questions about um, lithium, and Eric, I wanted to suggest all along, well, maybe we should put copper into the lithium in order to solve that problem. But I know that's just sort of a metallurgy joke. Um, <laughs> so um, we're going to start with Catherine had a question early on. Why did the Samsung battery fail? Yep. So great question. And I think it just goes back to exactly what uh, Ivor mentioned before. So in the, the traditional solid electrolytes, it's about the, the dendrites that uh, form at that interface. And if you just have a liquid electrolyte, then there's really nothing to, to stop them or prevent them from propagating right through the electrolyte and uh, short circuiting the cell. So uh, as I understand it, I haven't researched it, but as I understand it, that's the fundamental problem for, uh, for their structures. Okay. And the next question is from Virgil. Um, how are we going to keep the lithium out of our water supply? if it's that able to penetrate many materials? This kind of like harkens back to the lead-free solder question. Yeah, great question, Virgil. Um, wish I had a good answer for you. Um, Is so, it toxic? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, my guess is yes, um, but you know, come to think of it, I guess I don't know that, all the hazards I can, uh, you know, that. I have to deal with aren't from toxicity, it's because it's so volatile. Um, Maybe I can add a little bit to that, Eric. Go um, for it. I know that um, lithium is actually in seawater at very low concentrations, and uh, lithium is actually in uh, water underground uh, where they have um, uh, volcanic activity. Um, and it's really, uh, it's a concentration issue is how much lithium is okay. Um, mm. it, and so it's, it's all about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an ion, uh, an active ion in water. Um, and, you know, chances are lithium behaves a lot like calcium, like uh, phosphorus, uh, like those, those bone um, uh, minerals uh, in our body. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I think in uh, concentrations, um, it, it, I don't want to say it's not possible that it, it could accumulate, um, but you know, um, I don't think right now we don't have a problem. Gotcha. No, good, good question, actually. Yeah. So this this next question is from John. Um, what solid semiconductor alternatives are people considering to deter the dendrite breakthroughs that cause the short circuits in the lithium-ion batteries? Yep, so it's kind of the, the full gamut right now. Um, there's, uh, you know, polymers, composites, uh, um, uh, a whole class of, uh, you know, I guess glass-like ceramics, um, right? So I, those look particularly attractive. Uh, so these are sulfonated glasses and they have some really, really unique behavior in terms of their ability to, to densify under pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, that might be a really unique mechanism because they can sort of expand and contract with this very unique ability to, to densify under pressure. And then when you take that driver away, they just go right back to their original shape. So, you know, we're not talking huge strains here, but uh, strains big enough to, to help mitigate those stresses. So, um, yeah, so they're looking everywhere. Um, and I, there's, you know, those that LLZO ceramic is just one of the, the potential candidates right now. All right, and so we have two questions from James. The first one is, how does charging voltage affect the dynamics of what you have described? Does a higher voltage result in a failure sooner than if using the lower voltages? Yep, so it has a huge role because, uh, um, you know, we want to charge our batteries as fast as we possibly can, right? 
So if you're really trying to push that lithium across the, uh, the interface through the solid electrolyte and back into the, the anode, then you're basically just trying to stuff a bunch of lithium as fast as you can into all of those interface defects. And that's where this becomes really problematic, right? Because that diffusive mechanism, you basically just take it right out at the knees because it takes time for that mechanism to operate. So, uh, so yeah, it has a profound impact. Uh, there's a very strong, we'll call it a rate dependence, but in the context of a battery, it's a very large current density dependence. And that is obviously driven by the, the voltage, right? So, big <laughs> Well, and so the, the, the related question is, what is the reason to not leave a lithium ion battery fully charged if not being used for a long time? Does, does the fully charged state effect, encourage the lithium infiltration rate? Um, good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and the answer probably varies as you go from one type of architecture to another. So the solid state battery is just, you know, that's the one we looked at here. There's lots of other competing architectures. Um, and I don't know offhand, you know, unless it has something to do with the, um, this annealing process where you spend a lot of time there and you just end up with, uh, you know, single crystal lithium. Uh, because if you just leave it at room temperature, fully charged for a long time, then lo and behold, uh, you know, it uh, takes on a, a very different sort of, not crystal structure, but it goes from a, polycrystalline material to a single crystal potentially over time. Mm -hmm. So that could create some problems, maybe, a wild guess. All right, so this is kind of, all right, first of all, thank you everyone, thank you audience, thank you speakers, thank you co-host. Um, it's so, so nice to spend the evening with you. We're gonna take questions for the next 10 minutes. We've got about 11 open questions, but I always wanna make sure I thank everyone. Um, so this is a fun question from one of our graduates from 1952, Bob. Um, nice to see you, Bob. Um, so in 1952, so Ivor, you might be able to help with this, doing experiments for Professor Russ Smith on electrocarburization bath stimulation, essentially plating carbon on sample surface, we used rotating objective of metallograph to make nano diamond indentations. <laughs> Curious to see if any of my old equipment remains. Oh. <laughs> Wow, Ivor. Uh, man, <laughs> well, when I was there in 1971 to 75, I don't recall that. Um, you know, we well, then Steve Camp's probably out there. If Steve has an answer, he can kind of pipe in, probably. But yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just one of the roles of being a dean. Like, if the equipment hasn't been used in 20 years, we sh should probably make room for people like Dr. Herbert, right, to do kind of state-of-the-art work, you know. So I sure hope that's been dismantled, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware of um, it, but... <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, there, there could be somebody who still has it, in uh, the, has it down in the foundry. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so... Ivor, my internet connection is unstable, so you might need to take over if you if need be. But um, oh, sure. can you going to go ahead and read off a question and. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, the next generation of battery material. What is the next generation of battery material beyond lithium? Uh, so I don't know. So the lithium anode is considered the, the holy grail, right? It's got the, the, the highest volumetric and gravimetric energy density of anything on the periodic table. So that's the, the end all. Um, sodium anodes are being looked at. Uh, there's a few other composite anodes that people are looking at. Um, but in general, I would say this solid state device is the, the direction that, uh, most folks are gravitating towards, right? So, you know, put it this way, whoever figures out how to really make a really efficient solid state battery, game over. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, not to say there aren't other applications that need other types of energy storage devices, but in general, uh, whoever figures out how to, uh, you know, really do the solid state battery with lithium, uh, that's it. That's a, that is a fundamental game changer. All right. Uh, do you want to do the next one here, Janet? 
So I'll try. Um, Professor Herbert, do you ever have students who work in your lab? Are they undergraduates or graduate students only? Um, can other majors work with you too, or just material science and engineering students? Got it. So, uh, so yeah, we definitely um, um, do have undergraduate students that work along with the graduate students in the lab. There's a couple of different uh, avenues or mechanisms for being able to do that. Um, and no, you don't have to be an MSE student. You could be, um, at least potentially, from uh, another department. Um, so yeah, if that's something you're interested in and you're here uh, on campus, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email and uh, we'll get together sometime and talk about the possibilities. Yeah, it's, it's always possible that from other engineering colleges, people might transfer into <laughs> material science and engineering. That's right, yep. <laughs> or fall in love, right? So, you know, I started off in chemical engineering and I took, when I took, remember I was joking about you're at chapter eight of Callister. Well, that that's like the second year course in material science. And I didn't take it till I was a senior in chemical engineering. And I was just like, Oh, that's why metals can bend. And I just, I just got so excited about materials science because it was the sort of answer of kind of like the how things work, uh, but like at a chemistry level, but not at the atom level. It's like a step above the atoms and below like, you know, giant parts. Um, I love, I love material science. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is from Ward. Solid electrolyte equals no fire, correct? That's the basic idea, right? So it is a non-flammable electrolyte that is chemically stable or inert with the, the lithium. Well, and when a short circuit happens between the anode and the cathode, lith lithium burns? I mean, tell me exactly kind of what's going on there. Lithium? Uh, so I think is, you know, in a, in a packaged cell that's a solid state uh, device, you know, when they're cycled to failure, it doesn't catch on fire, the device just short circuits, right? So the, the fire comes about through the, uh, the flammable liquid electrolyte. So as long as you can remove that from the, the architecture, then uh, that's where the big safety boom comes from. Yeah, there is no, there is no hydrogen generated. Right. There is no aqueous solution in there as an electrolyte. That's right. Exactly. Very yeah. good. All right, this next question is from Todd. I work for Ford. Can you itemize a few applications for lithium batteries? Are there any hybrid uses? Itemize a few applications for, for the lithium batteries. So I guess, uh, you know, as far as the solid state version is concerned, uh, there's a handful of companies that are commercially producing those right now and all of their products go into uh, really high performance consumer electronics. So uh, smart watches and uh, a few smartphones, I think. Uh, uh, well, I don't know about the phones, take that back. Um, but they definitely do have them in a few watches that I'm aware of. Um, and, uh, you know, gosh, it, uh, I feel bad. I should know more of the companies that uh, are doing this, but uh, um, uh, Poly Plus out of California is one of those, right? And so again, it's one of these thin film type batteries, but the idea, right, it's the, the electrolyte is solid. So you're sort of limited in the, uh, the ability to diffuse the lithium through that. It certainly doesn't compete with the, the ionic conductivity of a liquid. So the way to get around that is to make those electrolyte layers pretty thin, and then you just start stacking a whole bunch of those layers together, right? So still, most of the applications right now are in thin film batteries. Um, Oak Ridge has been producing them since, gosh, uh, the early 2000s, I think. Um, so uh, a lot of work has been, you know, moving the ball down that field, but, uh, you know, it's just a really tough nut to crack. Um, and in general, you know, people have been working on this field for, gosh, 30, 40 years, right? And so we make a little progress and then we hit, you know, a brick wall and so things slow down. But then there's some evolutionary step, right? Somebody learns something new and that revives the whole field and here we go again. And so that's kind of what's happened now with the advent of these solid electrolytes, right? And yeah. so hopefully now, sort of this new knowledge that comes about from a lot of the work that people are doing is we've identified these mechanisms and here's what they're telling us about how to develop the, uh, the materials. So now let's go engineer materials that can behave the way we need them to behave in order to construct uh, uh, a successful device, right? So yeah. that's what's new about what's happening now. 
Well, and Eric, that's something that really struck me about your talk is that you are doing fundamental research, right? Sort of, you know, the mechanisms behind, you know, the degradation um, of these of these materials, which you can only do by studying them at the nanoscale with the state of the art equipment and, and having a deep understanding of these things. You took us from introduction to material science all the way through grad school in your talk. So <laughs> nice job of making it sound simple. But um, so I think we're going to take two more questions. The first one's for Dr. Anderson. What is the difference between metallurgical engineering, which is what you studied, and material science and engineering, which is kind of the modern term? And how did you choose your undergraduate major at tech? Oh man, that's a, that's a terrific question. Um, <laughs> I guess um, metallurgical en uh, engineering, uh, especially uh, metals always were intriguing to me. And as Janet alluded to, um, copper was all around me. I grew up in Hancock, okay? So uh, all those copper mines uh, up the Keweenaw Peninsula, uh, that's where, you know, I hiked around and I, I gathered little samples from. So I always wanted to work with metals. And metallurgical en uh, engineering is really that study of uh, how do you make things out of metals? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you make them better? Um, now, material science and engineering, as a metallurgical engineer, I like to think that it is. It falls um, as a in a broader context, um, and I think if you understand a lot of the things about metals, that you have a good background for understanding how do ceramics work, uh, especially in mechanical properties, um, uh, the ways of uh, consolidating ceramic powders, for instance. Uh, I work a lot in metal powders, so. Consolidation of powders is something that I think about a lot. Um, and, and even in polymers, uh, polymers have long chains for unit cells um, where, um, you know, basically you can make a, a single unit cell in a metal out of uh, a couple of atoms. Um, and, but alignment of these chains gives certain types of properties to polymers. Uh, so, you know, there's, it's the relationship, I think, actually, of the atomic structure to the final part mm -hmm. that ties material science together. These, we call them structural property relationships. Uh, and then being able to say, um, this is how that final part will perform. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm really... Um, I'm a fan of all materials. Uh, I don't. I don't want to pick any any specialties, but uh, uh, metals are are right there in my gut. So I I, I need to work with those. Yeah, you're from Copper Country. I know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, was there one other part? Is how did I select metallurgical engineering? I think. Well, you had to major in metallurgical engineering. You grew up here. You know. So. <laughs> it's true. There was. Uh, you know, if I like materials. Metallurgical yeah. engineering was it. And I started, by the way, as a freshman in metallurgical engineering. That's the first class I had, and I, I liked it from the beginning. So, yeah, it wasn't a choice for me. Well, and I'm going to combine two questions as the last question, Eric, for you. Um, so okay. the, the elements are, what was, you know, Dr. Herbert, what was your undergraduate major? How did you find out about material science, and how did you know it was for you? And then for prospective Michigan Tech students, what kinds of things should they study in high school to, to, to aim themselves towards solving problems like these complicated dendrite problems? Gotcha. Okay, so uh, uh, undergraduate major. So believe it or not, uh, first one was political science and business administration. Um, so uh, um, whoever asked that question, uh, send me an email and uh, um, we'll get together and I'll elaborate on that a little bit more because it's kind of odd how it all started off there. But uh, I had some really good friends that uh, uh, were all uh, engineers and uh, one of them happened to be a PhD student working for uh, one of the, the visionaries in our field. And so I did a co-op. Uh, with uh, with that company. And so it was through that company and the, the co-op experience that I really discovered, oh, wow, 
this is really fascinating stuff and I could see how it dovetailed to a lot of my interest in hobbies uh, growing up or as a you know, uh, young teenager all the way through college. And uh, um, so I guess it was really through the co-op and uh, uh, my friends that that's where I discovered uh, material science and how amazing that was uh, with respect to what I was interested in, right? So that's how I knew it was, uh, was for me, I guess, is the, the simple question or simple answer to that question. And so then what was the follow-up uh, to that? So, for, so if we're watching this as a prospective student for Michigan Tech and, you, mm -hmm. and, and I guess we're interested in material science, what kinds of things should we be taking in high school? So the best thing you can do to, uh, I think, get yourself prepared to walk into material science and engineering uh, uh, with high school curriculum is just study on the, or take the college prep classes, right? So they're gonna be your physics and uh, uh, calculus and um, uh, chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. Those are probably the courses that are gonna help you out the most because material science is kind of this interesting uh, amalgamation of all those topics, the, the physics, the solid state chemistry, um, and uh, lots of math, right? Um, and so those are all the tools that you use basically to uh, understand a lot of the concepts that we were talking about today. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's what I would take and that'll really set you up to be successful when you get to, get to college. If you take chemistry, if you're taking chemistry this year, or if you plan to take it next year, Michigan Tech's um, material science and engineering department is planning a high school offering of introduction to material science and engineering that would, could be counted for college credit. And so okay. if that's something you're interested in, um, just send an email to engineering at mtu.edu um, and we'll, we, will, we will collect your information and try to make sure you get information about that um, high school class because we're, in, we're actually, um, I think it's. I think it's going to be offered in the spring for the first time as a, as like a kind of like a test situation. So if you've already had AP Chemistry, you're interested in, you know, the D word dislocations and crystals and copper and metals and things like that. Um, we have we have a fun course for you. Uh, so send an email to engineering at mtu.edu. And you know what? I'm, I have to apologize. There's another eight questions out there, but I've I've just you know I've decided we can't spend all of Monday evening answering technical questions. We have to you have to be able to eat your dinner, you guys. And so I cannot thank you enough, Ivor and Eric, um, for your time this evening. Thank you, um, participants. It's so fun to hang out with you, and uh, we will see you next week. Warm and fuzzy logic, or I think it is what it was. And um, Yannick, when I just mentioned that if if there were a couple of questions I was I was reading ahead here. If people want to uh, ask me those questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer them uh, by email or or something like that. Do you feel like sharing your email? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, it's it's Anderson I at AmesLab.gov. And thank you for joining us from Ames Lab. And thank you, Eric, again, from Material Science and Engineering here at Michigan Tech. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody.